Okay, so uh, let me introduce myself. Sure. Yeah, I've been here for a year plus. Uh -huh. I'm from Malaysia. Uh -huh. So in Malaysia, I was educated in Malay and English. So my Chinese is very weak. Uh -huh. So I speak Cantonese with my mother, my uh -huh. parents. They do speak sometimes with me in Chinese, but yeah. It's okay. Also, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I think English. Yeah, so yeah, it's easier yeah, yeah. Yeah. English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how can I help? Okay, so uh, I was amazed, by the way, with the progress that has been made in Taiwan since I was in Malaysia. Uh, I, teaching in, I was teaching in University of Malaysia for many years, and then at that time I was asked to do some research about SE, social enterprise, and one of the leading uh, economy in building social enterprise is Taiwan, in Asia. So I was like, Perhaps, let me start with a general question here. What do you think about the success factor mm -hmm. of Taiwan mm -hmm. leading this, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. this so-called ecosystem, mm -hmm. bringing up many mm -hmm. uh, startups, mm -hmm. uh, successful startups mm -hmm. in, in Taiwan as well as some of this mm -hmm. uh, company can lead some mm -hmm. of the program mm -hmm. in which scale up and lead other countries to, you know, emulate the model here. Mm -hmm. So what is your idea? Well, definitely, I think a strong civic sector um, or social sector, as some people call it, mm -hmm. um, is the number one reason. Uh, you know, social entrepreneurship can succeed without a strong social sector uh, as the wider community. And in Taiwan, mm -hmm. uh, even before we had presidential election in 1996, there's mm -hmm. already uh, people doing community building, doing co-ops, uh, doing all sort of um, philanthropic uh, endeavors that then evolved into social entrepreneurship um, way before uh, the 80s. Actually, they started late 70s uh, during the community building phase. And so it's safe to say that the um, charities and co-ops and uh, social enterprises uh, in the 80s, they have a longer history and a building legitimacy compared to even the central government. People tend to trust uh, for example, the homemakers union, uh, people tend to trust Suzy, people trust the Keras Foundation mm -hmm. uh, or the Liren Company, uh, mm -hmm. arguably more than the minister. Uh, yes. And so uh, that provides a fertile ground for people when they see a social issue. Instead of relying on the government to solve the problem, people would just uh, start solving the problem by themselves and expect the government to support but not control. Uh, their end of life. And of course, after the democratization, this trend only continues. And so the central government, we always say, we can't beat the social sector, we must join the social sector. Uh, and that leads to, I think, the Asia's most free in terms of the rights, uh, freedom of speech, of assembly, and so on. And so that uh, a minister's blood and a social entrepreneur's blood is equivalent. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the social entrepreneur can amass a very large amount of following, mm -hmm. they actually can create alternate governing mechanisms, uh, such as the airbox uh, movement, where people measure air quality by themselves as a classic social innovation uh, that will then shape the Ministry of Environmental Protection's policy. And, and you can't say that for many Asian jurisdictions, uh, because in these jurisdictions, if the legitimacy of a movement or mobilization start to threaten the legitimacy of the central government, there's a little bit of censorship or control. But Taiwan, the, the sky is the limit. And so mm -hmm. I think that also promotes the uh, innovation to think in very broad terms, like an overview, uh, national scale terms, instead of only on community terms, because in other jurisdictions, community terms are safer. Do you see a shift? Because, well, I, I know little about Taiwan. Uh, I read a lot. Uh, from the book, he said that in the previous time, perhaps during the KMT time, uh, it has a tendency to hire many technocrats, mm -hmm. engineers mm -hmm. uh, who know about industry, mm -hmm. who know about manufacturing, mm -hmm. to, to be recruited mm -hmm. uh, to help the government. Mm -hmm. to, to, to do upgrading processes, to, 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 you know, to build mechanisms, you know, so that Taiwan can be a wealthy nation. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, after perhaps 1990s and more and more uh, people realize the importance of 
social enterprise, social innovations, what I see is that the government inviting mm -hmm. many professionals mm -hmm. or the social advocates, That's right. civil social advocates, to, part right. the, to participate in the so-called administrative activities. Yes. So is that a shift, would you say, uh, well, from I, technocrats I, to um, you know, social advocates? Well, I would uh, say in bringing up this it's not really about parties, political parties, but rather it is uh, literally a earth shattering event, uh, oh, the, yes, the yes. September 21 earthquake mm -hmm. around the turn of the century in 1999. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, during the recovery mm -hmm. process of the September 21 earthquake, mm -hmm. people start seeing that the government doesn't mobilize as well as mm -hmm. the social sector. Mm -hmm. And the social sector actors build a newfound solidarity between charities that used to take care of different things and also uh, between the people who need to revitalize their community economy after being forcibly relocated by the earthquake. And they have to find, for example, the, the plums uh, that was not a uh, star product became the star product of the Shaolin village uh, after the earthquake. And that's a classic social entrepreneurship uh, movement. And so they gained uh, social solidarity kind of uh, overnight because of the earthquake. Uh, then even when uh, KMT uh, was in charge during the Mayan Joe cabinet, uh, they still have a dedicated uh, minister of the portfolio uh, from Yen, Professor Fung, uh, in charge of social entrepreneurship. So anything that um, happened after the earthquake, mm -hmm. I think uh, those major parties have to endorse this kind of social movement because they recognize its uh, legitimacy as, as, as a potentially higher than a minister. So you do think that it's a shift, that it's a kind of like evolve, evolution? From yeah, we, we, we from owe getting a lot to Professor Feng Yuan uh, during her term uh, in the Mind to Cabinet mm -hmm. uh, to develop such an entrepreneurship plan. I see. So, do you think that they still, you know, need technocrats, you know, mm -hmm. these engineers mm -hmm. from Silicon Valley to come over here to do competitive sectors? Or do you see that Silicon Valley is changing, mm -hmm. right? It's less now about unicorns that uh, shoot for uh, growths that are exponential, mm -hmm. but social and environmental negative externality that are also exponential, right? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. nowadays, uh, Silicon Valley is about purpose-led companies, mm -hmm. it's about investment with a, uh, at least not harming the social environment, so mm -hmm. um, it's about um, carbon uh, neutral or even negative carbon uh, innovations about eco-design. Yeah. So, so basically, I think as long as people think in a longer term, like sustainable goals 10-year mm -hmm. horizon, the for-profit sector and the with profit mm -hmm. uh, social entrepreneurs tend to speak a uh, more common language as evidenced by say the B Corp movement uh, which is um, a certificate that even Kickstarter uh, want to you know get a B lab certificate saying that we are triple bottom line and things like that. So even Silicon Valley is changing. So while we do of course uh, do a talent circulation plan to try to get people overseas uh, considering Taiwan a perfect home, uh, not only so against coronavirus, but also <laughs> a really good place uh, to get a uh, what we call a gold card to start your own enterprise here, not necessarily to be hired uh, by someone. Uh, so these are all, I think, um, complementary. I uh, not really, so this co-competition, co like competition, mm -hmm. but competing to solve a global common problem, I think that is a uh, shared value uh, both by the industrial innovation sectors and the social innovation sectors. Because to me, some people will see that there is a separated sector where one focuses on competitive industrial activities, like you know, doing inventions, do patents, do smartphones, produce smartphones, while the other one, social enterprise, are focusing more on solving societal problems and so on. So we see that as a convergence of it's basically that it's still a need of time to because, see because in Taiwan, uh, our unicorns such as Global mm -hmm. uh, they're of course very competitive. Yeah, uh, yeah. And there's of course for e-scooters, uh, mm -hmm. which is a brand new field of uh, mm -hmm. industry, there's a lot of inventors as well. But at the mm -hmm. its core, Global is a renewable uh, energy storage uh, company. 
uh, it's basically reshaping not only about reducing emission, but also a more efficient way to uh, solve the energy problem. Uh, and so uh, I think they see themselves as having an environmental purpose alongside their social and uh, economic purposes. And their investors invest in them not only because um, you know of the ROI, but also because of the social return. Uh, and so I think um, the Taiwanese companies, because they know that the social sector always holds this ultimate weapon of social sanction. If you are a very profitable company, but somehow people show that you cause environmental or social harm, uh, the consumer's social sanction is very strong in Taiwan, uh, and the entire brand can dissipate overnight because of social sanction. So even out of self-interest, if they consider Taiwan one of their main markets, they will do uh, things that we consider as uh, sustainable or with profit or purpose led. Would SE seeing themselves dependent on the government or permanent government assistance? I don't, I don't think so. Because like Google itself, like, yep, the product is very, very uh, 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 excellent, you know, but would you see that they still need government to you know, facilitate the process of start purchasing, you know, Google like so that uh, 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 they will be consumed by, they will be demand by, mm -hmm. if we doubt the system of subsidies, you know, mm -hmm. from the government, we will see that they can compete to that of, yeah, the industrial. Well, the, the subsidy the, has the been, been declining, right? So yeah, at the yeah. very beginning, we do offer subsidies uh, in an effort to reduce air pollution. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, non-electric, uh, ordinary scooters, uh, if they operate their engine, they can also significantly cut emission. So our subsidies is about cutting emission. It's not about we uh, think only electric vehicle can get a subsidy. If you get a sufficiently advanced uh, uh, zero or near zero emission um, engine, then you also get the same subsidy. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think it's particular to, to go overall, uh, but it is of course particular to reduce emission. But that is actually just making sure that the external cost is re-internalized yeah. to yeah. the scooter company that will cause the environmental harm, right? So I, I don't think this is a, a subsidy. I think of it as a, um, you know, uh, externalization, uh, re-internalizing economic force, uh, but it's easier to explain as a subsidy. But would it be easy for them to compete in the international market? Like for example, you have Samsung, you know, big conglomerate that can scale up any product easily mm -hmm. while we say example you know the mm -hmm. and Zoom would be able to see itself competitive mm -hmm. uh, beyond the Taiwan small mm -hmm. well, yeah I mean it's a business and on the other hand yeah, China right? Right. it's a business question right yeah, so yeah. I think the Google mainly uh, excels uh, on design uh, so and I used to work with Apple uh, mm -hmm. for, for six years uh, with the Siri team. Mm -hmm. We uh, at the Apple, um, we always understood the designers are closest to the people. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we design uh, with people's need in mind, then it's not about cost down. Apple is not known for very cheap, <laughs> but, <that's, laughs> but rather it is about uh, co-evolving with yeah. the need of the society. Uh, and that also speaks to social entrepreneurship in general, mm -hmm. because if the social enterprise doesn't consult with the stakeholders and let stakeholders mm -hmm. be the co-creators, mm -hmm. then they can only be social entrepreneurship for so long yeah, until sure. the society shifts and they're not very social anymore. Yeah, yeah. Right? So I think uh, this ongoing dialogue is one of the main points that we're uh, promoting as part of our social innovation plan. Uh, and the organization that do it well, mm -hmm. no matter whether they're a co-op or company or whatever, uh, perform better, even internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, but the companies that don't do this, but invest mostly uh, in R&D and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, may actually uh, fail to detect the next wave of the society. I see, I see. So there will be no issues of scaling up in Taiwan's ecosystem. Right. In but, but which it has a it's way. about scaling deeply. Like uh, making sure that all the writers uh, are essentially co-creators and their ideas are taken into account into the next phase of product design and things like that. When you say all writers become the co-creator, what do you mean by that? Uh, I mean that uh, in many social enterprises, uh, for example in the B-Lab scorecard, mm -hmm. there is one access that asks if your um, 
um, buyer uh, or if your people on your supply chain and things like that mm -hmm. uh, have a, a good idea yeah. about how you operate, mm -hmm. how quickly can you integrate those innovations from your stakeholder crowd uh, into your R&D process? And this relies a lot, of course, on consultations online about the uh, feedback forms that they provide their app, uh, on their uh, service centers where you can just chime in your new ideas, uh, and um, of course, beta testing and things like that. Mm -hmm. And all these are just standard what we call agile development, where we deliver a not so perfect product, get people upset about it, they're so upset they can suggest new ideas, and we say, oh, your new idea become our product within a week. Uh, or two. So uh, the more uh, iterative the process, the shorter the feedback loop uh, time span is, mm -hmm. the more sociable I think is a enterprise. What about the smaller one? Of course, Google is very successful. Yeah, what about yeah. uh, uh, the smaller mm -hmm. SE in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Do they face a typical issue that mm -hmm. perhaps finding itself trapped mm -hmm. in both, you know, getting the investments on the other mm -hmm. hand, you know, getting more interested consumer to buy their products or buy their services. We, we just see uh, that a lot, of, a lot of early stage uh, SEs nowadays rely on crowdfunding. Uh, and so if there is no demand, well, they just don't do the product. <laughs> right? It's basically a way to externalize the risk. Mm -hmm. If people are um, willing to pay for a board game or something like that, you know already that there's a set of people who want to engage with you very early on, even before they see the product. Yeah. Um, and Taiwan, of course, also has a subscription-based uh, cross-crowdfunding model, uh, also um, equity-based crowdfunding model. So you can provide extra incentives to the like extra loyal subscribers that yeah. essentially make them shareholders. Uh, that's a possibility too. Uh, and so what I'm trying to say is that if you design the incentive mechanism just right, you can pivot quite a few times each time understanding that, oh, it's not a good market fit, it's not a good market fit, uh, until you find something that really is a market fit. Uh, and people are very, very tolerant of the teams that try a few times of crowdfunding and not very successful each way until they find something that really hires people's needs. I see. But uh, in, in, of course, in the textbooks, you know, national textbooks, they teach us about investment in terms of investing technology that being seen as short cycle and being seen as long cycle. Short cycle, as you mentioned, you know, in which uh, in response, in responding to market demand, there are a lot of you know, technology that can benefit us in long run, 10 years, 15 years, mm -hmm. and then uh, of course there is no demand for now, but it has a potential in the next five to 10 years. Would there be a space for entrepreneurs to aim for long cycle? Oh, very much so. Very much so. so no way they can, as you said, people, people, uh, as I the changes, the demand, the change of demand of consumer. Mm -hmm. You know, so well, that's where that, that's where the sustainable development goes uh, come to play, uh -huh. because these are things that people agree to reach uh, ten years from now, yeah. but it doesn't say how. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. So it has a, I mean, mm -hmm. someone has an idea, he or she has an idea. Yeah, and it can be good, but there is no. Existing demand, but that demand can be exists when you created something, you know, perhaps after five years, like yeah. how much products can be yeah. quite long, you know, to see exactly. Exactly. So, would that be a ground for entrepreneurs who aim for yes. long yes. cycle demand? Now, nowadays, nowadays, we ask them if they have such a uh, moonshot uh, idea to uh, aim for solving one specific yeah. sustainable goal. Yeah. Yeah. So, not one of the 17, but rather one of the 169. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they can uh, pinpoint to that particular goal, mm -hmm. then we actually do a lot of incubation right here. Mm -hmm. uh, we provide the office space for free, we provide Wi-Fi and uh, matchmaking uh, for free mm -hmm. so that they can learn about what the ecosystem is. And basically we absorb the, a lot of the R&D cost uh, for them and uh, they don't have to succeed. Uh, they can just fail openly. And if they fail openly, it provides something for other people to learn. 
from their later code as well. well. So this is the open innovation uh, ecosystem. I and see. so if they need a testing field, mm -hmm. there's the sandbox mechanism. If they need presidential buy-in, there's a presidential hackathon. Uh, if they need a local government or municipal uh, test ground, we have the social innovation tours. Mm -hmm. And all these, uh, and the office hours like today, right? Mm -hmm. So all these are uh, mechanisms through which that those moonshots can find like-minded people who don't expect a financial return within the next year, but rather with a shared focus, uh, with a single sustainable goal as a common focus, uh, they can just uh, be uh, partners uh, alongside the way, and if one of them fails publicly, everybody wins. Yeah, would, if we use, would you think that, so what's the, the new term called SROI, right? social yeah. investment, yeah. a measure to be used by the government to make like the, the ministry you know, decisions whether to fund or not to fund? Yeah, the, the, uh, yes, but the Council of Agriculture already uses SROI. SROI. Yeah, yeah so they, they would be a measure to evaluate. In, in that, so evaluate. They, they, they already do that. So, uh, is that? Yeah, so if you uh, look for, um, I'm trying to think of is this. Is it a robust thing. measure? You know, measuring. They've been doing this for a few years. <laughs> it's robust ish, right? So the <laughs> Soil and Water Conservation Bureau, mm -hmm. uh, or Shui Hu Bao Shi Zhu, if you search for that and SROI, mm -hmm. you will see how it funds and how it uh, do this kind of multi stakeholder measurements to calculate the SROI. And they calculate it correctly as something uh, calling it one, right? It's a ratio, it's not a KPI. Yes, um, yes, and yes. They, they do that very well. And so I encourage you to look into the concept of agriculture's current use of SRI. I see, I see. So we see fund for SD. Does it exist yet? Okay. Which we see fund uh, for social enterprises. Specialized we see fund for Yeah, this. of course. Of course. Is there specialized we see fund? Yeah. Uh, so, for example, there is. Uh, what they call a sh um, sh or Shui um, mm -hmm. uh, Hui So uh, the B current impact investment is one of the impact uh, investors. They, they uh, invest only with businesses uh, that are profit with purpose. Oh, and they uh, already have uh, like six SDGs uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in their focus. Uh, and there's uh, many uh, portfolio companies that have already grown to be uh, pretty good, like the Green Vines, uh, the uh, Shenru Farm, the, the milk uh, company mm -hmm. uh, are, I wouldn't say household names, but they're they're kind of visible. Uh, the, the plum after the earthquake, uh, yeah, yeah. 2021, uh, the Ganlo Wenchuang, the culture art in nature, uh, these are also a very successful um, portfolio in their uh, investments. So you can look at B current of Asia. B is just a letter, B current of Asia. A is their portfolio. Do you see that entrepreneurs in Taipei or Sintus are more organized and capable to that of other cities? Yeah, because my, so. my students was asking, yeah. you know, you have been tour around Taiwan and see the needs of social entrepreneurs for different regions. Yeah. So would you see that those that or the they, they area, or less solve, urban area. No, they, they solve different problems. I see, I yeah. see. So there is no priority be given to people here, but they are so equally opportunity to be given to. Of course. Of course. Yeah, like if government. you want to solve social problems and your preferred uh, tool set uh, is a smart machinery, mm -hmm. then it makes sense to fund your social enterprise in that job because that's the cluster of smart machinery. Uh, and so depending on how your supply chain looks like, you would want to be based in the place. And for example, uh, the, uh, there's, there was um, a, there still is, um, the Blue Seeds, uh, which is a also kind of famous, uh, you can find them, their products in Family Mart. Uh, and what they do uh, is that it uh, works with indigenous lands uh, to um, make like a vida like um, products for uh, self care, hair care, and things like that. Uh, and they um, work with indigenous designers. They use um, only the kind of farming that restore the viability of the land. And of course, they will uh, have to set up in Haidong because that's uh, where this kind of zero chemical and indigenous yeah. lands and things like that uh, is, is at, right? So uh, they, of course, headquarter in Haidong. Would there be a special uh, location for those? you know, looking at the rural areas so from the Gulf. 
perspective. Yeah, so just, you know, we, we, we tour around at yeah. one and then give such uh, teleconference conversations and anyone who uh, wants to set up a such innovation lab or a unit uh, within their municipality uh, can just connect to this video conferencing yep. tour that we do. Uh, and so there is uh, Kaidong uh, and Hualien well, as the two main uh, eastern centers. Mm -hmm. And there's also the ones in Kaohsiung, uh, in Kaichung, in Taoyuan, uh, and, and of course here in Taipei City. So you have office everywhere? That's right, that's right. Uh -huh. But wherever we do a tour, everybody joins. Oh, I see, I see. Right. So do government have special location? I mean, just to you know, because those living at Taito and so on, uh, mm -hmm. it's sort of like may not see themselves at the advantage mm -hmm. uh, position because people in Taito would have definitely access to many different networks, mm -hmm. you know, many different funders and so mm -hmm. on. They are well articulated and so on, but those living at different mm -hmm. regions in Taiwan may see themselves disadvantaged and mm -hmm. Yeah, any, uh, yeah, assistance yeah. special we, we, make, we make an effort to run our social enterprise uh, yeah. annual summit outside Taipei. So, oh. so uh, a year ago, we ran uh, the summit in Kaohsiung, mm -hmm. uh, and the year before that, I was in Kaichung. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I think it's very important to show people in different municipalities that there's just different specialties, different cultures, even different ecosystems in each municipality, but there's no um, better or worse. It depends on which um, culture you associate yourself with. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's actually the core uh, of social entrepreneurship, it's about building a culture of sharing, right? So uh, I think I totally agree that uh, we need to emphasize like non uh points, and there are uh, existing like for quite a title dedicated funding, like while it's using uh, or uh, in Zhu uh, finance is for indigenous lands, uh, and we do uh, work very closely with the uh, Council for Indigenous um, Affairs as well as uh, the Huangong uh, people. Those who focus on the, you know, helping the local people, would you see that they're able to scale up and whatever so solutions they create very much so, very much so. can be exported? Very much so. For example, the Blue Seeds uh, model working with indigenous people in Taitong, mm -hmm. they not only export their products to, say, Vancouver, they actually export their mechanism so that the native uh, people, the indigenous people in Canada, mm -hmm. who uh, about the same time as Taiwan actually, uh, they're um, building a, a new identity, right? Their uh, transitional justice process yeah. they did a few years before Taiwan did, and, and now they're a semi diplomatic mm -hmm. relationship with the Canadian government. Uh -huh. And so they also want the same like cultural identity building process where they can re-identify with the traditional plants that they grow, but uh, promote them through marketing channels, uh, like a Vida as a luxury brand, uh, mm -hmm. instead of something that you help the indigenous people with. Uh, right. It's the indigenous wisdom helping you, right? And, and so I think the social innovation mechanism actually spreads faster than individual products. You may heard of this company called City Love, right? Mm -hmm. Our City yeah, of course, of course. Can this, mm -hmm. this kind of model, you know, so for business model, yeah. being able to scale up. Yeah, I, I, I was with and our expert, expert yeah. uh, in Professor the, Lin, right? Yeah, I, I was with Professor Lin uh, in Christchurch in New Zealand. Uh -huh. um, and the New Zealand people love that as well. I, I think uh, there's a lot of cultural similarity between New Zealand and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, both are islands uh, uh -huh. and both are uh, like absolutely free you know, civics freedom, and those are, I mean, encountering the virus pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, there's a lot of similarities. And in the NSAC, in our uh, bilateral agreement, there's a special track about culture, including indigenous culture in a special chapter. Uh, and so, yeah, that's one of our value allies, but there's many others as well. SE role in healthcare, do they play an important role in yeah, healthcare? They do, they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like you know, using important information for so what role they can play, especially during this mm -hmm. yeah, uh, uh, yeah. state of crisis, right? Yeah. What is their role in, in, in helping society? Right. So uh, there is, uh, for example, the uh, previous deputy mayor uh, of Taichung, mm -hmm. uh, Ling uh, it uh, was a uh, very important uh, social entrepreneurship when it comes to the aging care uh, of the Hong Dao Foundation. Uh, and I think uh, she pioneered mm -hmm. this idea of uh, bringing social entrepreneurs as uh, rebranding how uh, long-term healthcare 
and care for the aging legs. Because in the long-term healthcare uh, 2.0, uh, the idea is that there's uh, so-called uh, uh, C class C centers, uh, which is just everywhere, like grocery stores and things like this, within uh, walking distance. And they may be operated by such entrepreneurships uh, specializing in, for example, running a cafe. Uh, and the cafe is designed to be very friendly to the elderly. Uh, but the people who participate in the long-term health care, um, most young people who want to devote their career into long-term health care, first face the resistance from their family, because their family doesn't see care for the elderly people yeah. as a career with a good ladder Correct. to improve. Yeah. And so uh, David Mayer, uh, Lainey at the time, worked on an exchange program with Japan, well, who you know has a lot of medical uh, technologies to learn, and they can also learn foreign language and also get an international certificate. And once they're back in Taiwan, they are a cafe owner, right? <laughs> it's like they can design their own ambience and uh, have a career, career ladder. They can even get an EMBA or something. Uh, and then uh, their parents are much more comfortable uh, people, um, you know, enrolling themselves into the long-term care company. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that social entrepreneurship uh, spans a lot of things, but especially around intergenerational solidarity. Uh, it shows that elderly people are not just there to be taken care of with the right design of co-creation. The elderly people's wisdom can also input into a social enterprise as, uh, for example, their stories or their uh, cultural artifacts or just the fact that they want to talk about their life over coffee with you, <laughs> that yeah. provide a, yeah. a local uh, learning center as well. Okay, perhaps I go to, to, to the last two questions. Sure, sure. Your view about Southeast Asia, uh -huh. yeah. generally, uh -huh. about the market, about the, you know, the needs of societal needs, mm -hmm. and so on. What is your view about, in general, Southeast Asia market? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the greater uh, East Asia region is, is totally the future. Uh, and not only because more people will be born there in the future, <laughs> but actually uh, the, the diagnosis thing um, is uh, the, what I believe uh, is uh, transculturalism, meaning that uh, in Taiwan, there was a very long time where there is only one national language. And um, there may be progress from uh, the technocrats that you mentioned, yeah. that you had a cost of uh, a dwindling uh, identity of other cultures and other languages, mm -hmm. and this is a very important fact. Mm -hmm. uh, but nowadays, we have uh, 20 national languages or more, including the sign language. Mm -hmm. So you can see the CECC uh, live stream, there's always a uh, yeah. new sign language sure. interpreter. Sure. Uh, and so we're becoming much more inclusive, and people around Taiwan can choose to learn their basic education in any of the national languages mm -hmm. and there uh, very soon is going to be required mm -hmm. to uh, learn their uh, mother tongue, mm -hmm. uh, including of course um, people, children of new immigrants, mm -hmm. uh, most of them from the East Asian yes. uh, countries. Mm -hmm. And so we're quickly becoming a transcultural uh, republic. Uh, and that, I think, is Taiwan's future. Mm -hmm. But in a certain sense, many East Asian countries are already there. Yeah. And you are already very much transcultural. <laughs> 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 we see some people who have some, you know, perhaps, what should, what was, maybe perhaps some conservative minded people mm -hmm. who have some, find themselves very hard, you know, to accept this so called movement you know, towards Trump culture. So, I, I think you know, I think yeah, there yeah. is definitely resistance. Yeah. Even a very simple thing saying, you know, we can start immersing uh, kindergarten children in English. Yeah. A yeah. simple thing as that. Correct, correct. Meets resistance. Correct. So uh, and, and that's uh, arguably easier actually in East Asian countries. If you decide to, you know, have a uh, bilingual kindergarten with your mother tongue and English, it's yeah. not seen as something abnormal. Yeah. Uh, in most East Asian, Southeast Asian countries. Yeah. But somehow in Taiwan, it means resistance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would say that it's definitely there. I is. will see there's a conflict too, you know, see Taiwan is married, you know, Southeast Asia partners, and then eventually you see that all the time they get issues and then they get divorced and then. Yeah, yeah, many, many other things, yeah, because of this yeah, so -called a lot, yeah. uh, mismatch thinking and so on. So a, lot of, a lot of people feel um, uncomfortable if the kind of 
the new children of new immigrants mm -hmm. speak their mother tongue and English yeah. better than their grandparents mm -hmm. who speak maybe Mandarin and mm -hmm. uh, Taiwanese Hola or Hakka, yeah. right? Uh, but I think this uh, can be uh, ameliorated by more intergenerational solidarity. Essentially, by grandparents talking to their children more, mm -hmm. or, or the other way around, I see. And, uh, which is one part of our new curriculum, <laughs> is for the children to learn more from their family and their local community rather than strictly from textbooks. Yep. Uh, and so, I think it will take time, but it will heal. Uh, and uh, I'm quite optimistic. About I see. Can the immigrant play a role in social enterprise? Definitely. Even when they're child. Definitely. Yeah. Many of them are blue-collar workers that yeah. can't articulate well both in English or in Chinese, but they may have good ideas. They yeah. may be able to solve many problems that they, do, that they use, I mean, many solutions that they use in their home country. They can bring it in. How That's that right. kind of communication can be created? Are you in touch with a social enterprise called 140? Mm -hmm. they, they do that a lot. I see. I yeah. see. Okay. So uh, the name comes from uh, when they were founded. Uh, New uh, migrant workers comprise one forty of Taiwan's population, so that's that's their name. Uh, and um, of course, uh, what they're doing is not only uh, empowering the uh, migrant workers, but they empower them with the aim that they can be like cultural ambassadors. So oh, that when they finish their migrant working term and go back to their own country. They may, I don't know, start a cafe <laughs> or <laughs> pursuing their career, mm -hmm. uh, but also bring some of the know hows mm -hmm. of how to operate social enterprises, mm -hmm. such as 140 themselves did, mm -hmm. uh, back to their own country. So it's kind of like an uh, education center plus incubator. I uh, see. And, and I strongly encourage you to reach out to them. I they, see. they have very good connection to the migrant mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, which country in South Wales now that we're talking about? Let's say the South Park policy, right? Taiwan South Park policy. Yes. Which country will provide a lot of assistance, help, and learning opportunity for Taiwan? And yeah, yeah, South Park yeah, every one of them. Because I can see that there's yeah. some sort of like tendencies to work more closely with people in Thailand and Vietnam. And somehow I don't see much effort being made uh, to interact or communicate with, with it, perhaps uh, people in India or perhaps people in. Indonesia and so on. This is just my perceptions. Is that is that is that true? No, I think we, we are very active in, in, in all, all countries, in all the countries. Yeah. It's just so that so they, they have different uh, points of contact. I see. Yeah. I see. And and some focus on uh, as you said uh, about uh, the empowerment of migrant workers and things like that. But there's some uh, East Asian countries that focus more on agriculture and sustainable uh, agriculture economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, uh, New Zealand is in its own class, right? <laughs> and they, they care uh, a lot about uh, environmental protection, but also about technology and filmmaking and, and culture and things like that. So, yeah. so each country has its own focus, mm -hmm. and we work with them on different platforms, uh, such as the Global Cooperation and Training Framework, or the GCPF. Um, and so I think um, it's very clear that we need to be working with the countries on their terms and so, not on Taiwan's terms. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. When you talk about sustainable agriculture, that one is also include the high tech. Yes, of course. You know, the use of high tech of in course. the agriculture of course. activities. Like, like precision uh, counting and detection of uh, agricultural uh, issues using uh, drones. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. And that is something that Taiwan does very well. But many poor yeah. countries in Southeast Asia may not have money to buy all this you know, high tech. Well, on the yeah. other hand, drones are very cheap now. Yeah. So, so they can take care of a huge, say, a, a pineapple field. Yeah, uh, yeah. And counting the pineapples and even help spraying uh, the necessary um, chemicals without overspraying, which is one of the issues that leads to unsustainable agriculture. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the cost is low enough, I think, that people are starting to express their interest. And especially if they are open innovation, in the sense that the local people can appropriate the technology uh, into appropriate technologies that fits their own design. Like, like grassroots innovation, there will exactly. be a lot of interaction. Exactly. exactly. Here yeah. as well as yeah, the as, as I said, the air box, water box, whatever, they are all open blueprints. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to pay a licensing fee or anything. Mm -hmm. You can just bring a working prototype back, and then everything after that is just open innovation. I see. I see. Would that make Taiwan give up a lot? 
can't receive much of that. Yeah, yeah. But, but that's how we crowdsource the innovation. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to innovate everything ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if people take our idea and make improvements, we also benefit. When they get the product yeah. improved, then we also yeah. copy yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah. So we're very good at copying that. So you think that <laughs> IP will longer be useful in the near future, do you think? Yeah, very very much so. Because the IP is not just for protection, it's also for sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have a good uh, culture about what we call creative commons, mm -hmm. then the sharing is just by, by plagiarism. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You copy a uh, I don't know, Microsoft Windows. Yeah. Certainly you would not write an email uh, to Microsoft saying, hey, I just copied your Microsoft. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, with creative commons, with their own innovation, uh, like Wikipedia, mm -hmm. people who remix Wikipedia mm -hmm. or who make derivative products and so on, they do actually contribute their fixes, their even just fixing one typo back to Wikipedia. And that's because they have a good circulation of creative commons. Yeah. So Taiwan is striking for them. It's no yeah, longer the whole model talking about data, semiconductor industry, mm -hmm. and so on. Do you think? That? Well, that's that's because the in the semiconductor industry, it's not about new ideas. It's about execution. Execution, execution is the main thing that differentiates TSMC yeah. with what everybody else. <laughs> but but in such an entrepreneurship, it's more about finding the fit with the society, mm -hmm. and so it necessarily have to adapt when it comes to a new soil. Because every time when I come back to Korea and Taiwan, mm -hmm. it was once like, you know, both are equally good, you know, I'm seeing their patent activities are going up. But recently we see that what we see, what I see recently is that Korea is still going up, mm -hmm. but we see that a, a, a declining trend mm -hmm. we observe mm -hmm. uh, for the case of Taiwan. So, is that what, uh, so if you only compare patents, I think it's a Just quite, quite, quite narrow, narrow, yeah. quite narrow I agree. competition. Yeah. I think that WEF, uh, including patents, uh, but a lot of other innovation criteria. Mm -hmm. That's why the World Economic Forum list now went into the uh, top four super innovators yes, for yeah. two years running now. Sure, sure. Uh, they look at a mm, uh, multitude of metrics. But I think um, Korea is also doing very well. I've mm -hmm. been there many times, I really respect them. Mm -hmm. uh, but for social entrepreneurship, they uh, basically have a more municipal and governmental focus. They have an act that specifically promotes certain kinds. Mm -hmm of social entrepreneurship mm -hmm. around social welfare and, and empowerment, which is great. Mm -hmm. But in Taiwan, our social innovation came from the grassroots, from this uh, huge swarm of misnames. Mm -hmm. uh, and the misnames uh, they are extremely agile and bring out new innovations uh, without even waiting for the cycle to get uh, their patents uh, mm -hmm. issued. They don't even bother patenting it because just like in fashion, if it goes out of fashion within a quarter, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. don't have it, the fashion design. Right, right, right. right. so, so I think it's the agility that is the backbone of the Taiwan's Ministry Innovation. But I'm very um, grateful that Korea is showing a different sort of such an innovation. Yeah. They're also doing very well. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. So thank you very much. So mm -hmm. you know that uh, well what the yeah. professor do. We uh -huh. we write books and yes. When we write books, we make students to read it. So I have two books. <laughs> if you don't mind, you know, of course, read, of course. accepting Thank something you. small. This is about Malaysia. This is a Malaysia uh, awesome. uh, innovations yeah. uh, in the city context. Okay. As well as the, the other one is about agriculture. Okay. So yeah. So if I'll be glad nice. yeah. I'll just place it in my office yeah, and share it with my colleagues. That would be great. That would be. Thank you very much Thank for spending time with me. Thank yeah. You. I will hope that we can keep in touch. Of course. Of course. You have yeah. one email just. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, see you. Cheers. Yeah.